Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the webinar HIL real time simulation for testing of microgrids and power electronic systems. My name is Yahya Bouzid, and I will be hosting the webinar today. Let's talk about today's presenters. Uh, let me first introduce our special guest, Antonios Vandulakis. He is sales director at Yotavolt, which is the Opal RT distributor in several countries, including Greece and Bulgaria, among others. Second speaker will be myself, Yahya Bouzid. I am technical manager at Opal RT Europe. My role is to coordinate uh, all technical activities of Opal RT technologies in Europe and Africa. And apart from hosting the webinar, I will be glad to be sharing a presentation with you. We also have with us Ismail Rukiwi, who is field application engineer and who deals with customer service at Apollo T Europe. This includes tech support, commissioning, trainings, as well as pre-sales activities. Here is the webinar outline. First, uh, Antonios will will uh, begin the webinar with a Yotavolt corporate presentation. So he will share with us the activities uh, of his company and how we are tied together with Opality. Then I will present the challenges in developing microgrids and how OPARRT real-time simulators can help you in addressing them. And after this quick overview about the challenges, my colleague Ismail will show you a microgrid demonstration running on one of OPARRT's real-time platforms. At the end of the webinar, we will have a few minutes for questions and answers. Please feel free to send your questions in the question box during the session. And also please let us know to whom best. We will uh, address all these questions uh, during uh, the question time. If ever we don't have time to address all of them, of course, we will do it uh, by email after the session. I just remind you that the session is recorded, so you will have access to it later on. And it's time to start. So, Antonios, the screen and the microphone are yours. Thank you very much, uh, Yahya, for the introduction. Um, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining. I'm not sure if you can see my screen. Yeah. So, um, it's we have it from here. Perfect. So, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Antonios Vandudakis, and I'm the Sales Director of Yotavolt. Um, during this uh, short presentation, I would like to share with you more information about our company, uh, what we do, and uh, how we can support you in uh, your projects. Mm -hmm. So, as a company, we provide um, measurement and laboratory solutions for engineers and scientists. We were established back in uh, 2000, 2005 in Bulgaria, and uh, today we're covering 17 countries in Central and Eastern Europe and um, the West Africa through our offices in nine countries. Um, we are already 15 years in the field of test and measurement. Uh, as you can see in um, uh, this slide, the map better highlights our presence in uh, Central and Eastern Europe in Western Africa. As you can see, we operate through nine offices in Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Croatia, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, and Greece, for covering all the region from Poland uh, down to Cyprus. Uh, um, now, what we do as a company? We distribute development tools or complete solutions from uh, various uh, recognized, well established companies as Opal RT and others for your test and uh, measurement projects. Uh, moreover, we can help you build your lab and teach uh, your students the latest science and engineering concepts. Uh, we have the technical expertise to develop and uh, build complete applications and provide you a final tanky solution that consists of both hardware and software. Um, we provide reliable on-site and in-lab calibration services for your instruments. We're able to offer you uh, instructor-led online or tailor-made training courses to help you uh, get up to speed quickly. And last but not least, we provide 
uh, repair services and extend replacement coverage for uh, your hardware. Uh, who do we serve? Through our partners that I'm going to um, present you right after this slide, we serve any kind of sector that involves applications with a simulated physical or wireless measurements. So transportation, automotive, power and energy, telecommunications, aerospace and defense, or maritime are some of the sectors that we are active uh, in. Um, now, how do we serve these sectors? We are able to serve these sectors by having established uh, strong partnerships with companies that are experts in different fields. Our company started approximately 15 years ago as a distributor of national instruments, but along the way, um, we uh, established additional important cooperations with companies uh, that are shown in this slide for distributing their solutions and addressing different types of applications. So, in order for you to have more information on the applications we are able to cover through our partners, uh, National Instruments provides data acquisition hardware and software for automated testing and measurement for control applications. NI, for those of you that are not familiar with, is the company behind uh, LabVIEW. Um, Etos Research uh, is a company, NI company, that is uh, one of the leaders in the um, field of software defined radio. Digiland, again, one of NI companies, um, is one of the leaders in the design, manufacture, and uh, distribution of FPGA boards. Moreover, as a company, we're able to uh, cover needs when it comes to complete laboratory solutions uh, and setups, the equipment, uh, designs, manufacturers, and uh, provides complete solutions for with emphasis in mechanical, civil, aerospace, and electrical engineering. Um, and one of teams is in the field of telecommunications, Pitlisman and Drava Solutions are NI Alliance partners that uh, develop solutions uh, with emphasis in energy, water engineering, industrial control, and IoT. Uh, in the field of robotics, we cooperate with companies as Quanza, Robotnik, Innova, and ClearPath that develop um, solutions around robotics and mechatronics. Uh, as you can see here, we cooperate with various companies in the field of benchtop and IT hardware and software solutions. And when it comes to, to academic or industrial real-time simulation um, solutions for power systems, power electronics, uh, aerospace, and the automotive uh, segments, uh, we are proud uh, to cooperate with Operality and um, distribute their project, products. Uh, Operality is the world leader, as Yahya will probably um, mention also later on in the development of PCO FPGA based real-time simulators, uh, HIL testing equipment, and uh, rapid control prototyping systems for designing, testing, and uh, optimizing control and protection systems using power grids, um, power electronics, motor drives, automotive, etc. Um, so uh, I, at this moment, um, I, I, I would like to pass uh, back to uh, Yahya. Um, the presenter's role um, so that he can uh, further introduce OpalRT and present how OpalRT can help you in the hardware in the loop, real-time simulator, simulation for testing of microgrids and power electronic uh, systems. Thank you very much. Yeah, here. Thank you very much, uh, Antonios, for, uh, for this overview about the company. And for sure, we hope that we can go very far away with our collaboration. So uh, I would like to uh, start here presenting uh, a few slides about the challenges uh, that we can face when developing microgrids, which is uh, one of the trendy topics that we can um, that we can face uh, for those who are interested in this field. And uh, during this presentation, it will be around 15 to 20 minutes. I'd like to cover three big uh, three big things. First of all is a couple of uh, facts about Operati technologies. Then we will switch to uh, the microgrid world uh, and especially the challenges that we can face when trying to develop, uh, to design, to implement such systems. So we will talk about uh, technical approaches, but not only that. And then uh, a couple of, um, of minutes about the benefits uh, that real-time simulation can bring 
uh, when it comes to tackle these issues uh, they can face. Operati Technologies uh, nowadays is the world leader in the development of real-time digital simulators based on PC and Apple. Uh, the field uh, in which we are involved is uh, essentially uh, real-time digital simulation. And the purpose of these systems is uh, to facilitate the design, validation, and optimization of complex control systems, which can be found in any industry today. Uh, and we're focusing more on microgrids. So what we do is design uh, devices which can scale up from compact simulators to large integrated test benches, depending on customer needs. So uh, we can speak about uh, like desktop-based systems that can be used in lab until uh, bigger racks with uh, multiple uh, other services that can be offered by the system which would be close to a plug and play implementation for customers. So we deliver, we commission the system, turn it on and we start testing. Obviously, we are not distributing hardware only. Uh, there is a lot of software behind it and especially simulation software that helps to uh, represent complex systems uh, that are the base of the environment uh, of the units under test. So the purpose, I mean, what we do in the end is provide with devices uh, and with uh, software modules, which uh, can simulate control and physical models. And in the end, we want to connect this to uh, either uh, physical prototypes or controllers like devices under test. And again, the purpose of this is to help uh, engineers or researchers to design, optimize, validate and maintain complex systems that will be working on the field at some point. So we do have uh, real-time simulators that are, uh, let's say, running uh, simulations representing these systems and connected to real devices under test, uh, control devices or power devices or electromechanical devices, generally speaking. So why would we do such things? So why would we use uh, such kind of simulation systems? Well, if we try to focus on the power systems world or the microgrids, uh, if you want to narrow the discussion, uh, there are different main topics that we can uh, think about. Uh, one of them is uh, the control system testing. So we are developing uh, controllers, do have uh, very complex uh, algorithms or very complex programs embedded, and we need to test all these things. So we need to make sure that the control system is going to work before installing it on the field. And we want to make uh, or to we want the commissioning phase to be as smooth as possible and as fast as possible. And this can be performed thanks to pre-validations in the lab with uh, real-time systems. Uh, we can perform system level studies with uh, with simulation systems. Uh, either power flow analysis can be fault analysis. We can assess uh, the cybersecurity features of a system. We can study the impact of renewables. We can try to see how power electronic based devices are impacting as well the grid. And finally, uh, for those who are interested in protections, uh, real time systems can be used as well, uh, either to test uh, intelligent electronic devices, IEDs. We can test interoperability between devices coming from different vendors and obviously as well uh, assess uh, and test protection schemes. So upon our team today, uh, we have seven offices around the world with headquarters in Montreal, Canada, and then offices in North and South America, in Europe uh, and in, um, in India, as well as uh, technical services as well offered uh, in, in China. We do have 280 employees uh, as of today and more than 100 customers uh, who are trusting us. So with whom do we work? What kind of uh, industries uh, do we address? So it can be power systems industries, can be power electronics, so energy conversion. Uh, these are the two main uh, industries that we are working with. Uh, and we do have as well many uh, projects with aerospace, automotive and other transportation. Uh, all these sectors that we work with uh, can be uh, addressed in, let's say, with two kinds of end users, which can be both industrial or academic. So almost half of our uh, projects are related to industry, I mean, or are uh, implemented 
uh, at industrial uh, customers' place, and others are more on uh, academic-based research in, in universities or research labs. So now that we have a, uh, let's say, an overview or a clear view about what Operati does, uh, I would like to focus more on the challenges uh, that we can face with microgrids. Uh, and then the last part will be what can be brought by rate time simulation to tackle them. Well, the challenges we can face, uh, they have different natures. Uh, they can be technical. And as engineers, it's true that we focus a lot on that. But we shall not forget that they can be as well uh, economical uh, or regulatory. So technical challenges we can face with microgrids, uh, well, typically uh, on-grid, off-grid operation. So what happens if the microgrid is not uh, anymore connected to the distribution grid? Uh, is it capable to work on its own? And this leads to these grid forming topics uh, or black star topics, which can be kind of, uh, kind of tricky in the end. Uh, more general topic is uh, power balancing. So how do we make sure that we are serving power to all the uh, consumers in the microgrid? And of course, assess protection schemes, uh, talk about power electronics controls, how we integrate renewables. So because uh, they are not producing all the time and because they are decentralized, that's a challenge as well. And the last uh, topic is about interoperability. So how we make sure that different devices from different vendors uh, operating together, how to make sure that they can understand each other. We can face as well economical uh, challenges, which can be related to design costs, to maintenance costs, or simply to a, the business model that can be used to make a bankable grid. So as you all may know, uh, of course, technical issues are super important, but if uh, a project is not economically viable, uh, there's no sense in having it technically implemented. So we need to take care about uh, the economical aspect. And then last part as well, which is more regulatory or legal. Uh, one has to take care about uh, the framework uh, in which uh, a microgrid uh, has to be implemented. So what is the framework for uh, the sale and purchase of electricity? Uh, what is the policy when it comes to interconnect uh, microgrids with uh, distribution grids? Uh, what is the relationship that can be built with uh, utilities? And how do these microgrid operators uh, or these uh, DSOs as well uh, compete uh, in, in the energy market? So uh, in the end, if we focus a little bit more about the technical challenges, uh, we do have uh, today and we will have more and more IEDs, intelligent electronic devices on the field. Uh, they include measurement devices control devices, protections, monitoring rooms. So a bunch of uh, systems uh, which are there to make sure that everything is working smoothly. We need to make sure that uh, we are controlling properly power flows, that we are properly uh, addressing on-grid and off-grid operation, that we are delivering quality of service in the end so that all users, all customers are served in a proper way. We have this challenge as well related to uh, distributed and ancillary energy resources. So uh, typically, I mean, typical examples, PV and uh, wind turbines, they uh, can be highly distributed. Uh, they are uh, as well intermittent, so we, they do not produce power in a very predictable way or it's not all the time the same amount. So we need to take care of the energy coming and uh, be able to deliver it somewhere. Uh, we can face as well these interoperability issues. So we, there are devices which are built by different vendors, uh, especially IEDs. Uh, they are supposed to comply with some standards, but as you know, there can always be a, a small uh, difference between uh, a standard and an implementation. But in the end, in the field, we need to make sure that the whole thing works smoothly and that uh, if we take different devices from different vendors, they will speak with each other properly and they will understand each other to coordinate uh, the complete control strategy uh, of uh, the, the grid or the microgrid. Now, 
we are somehow starting to speak about uh, assessment of a system, validation of a system, how we make sure that it works. Uh, well, we can debug in the field. Why not just install the whole thing and see if it works? And if it doesn't, well, we just have to fix it and it will be okay. Well, uh, it's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, something you have to keep in mind is that when a, a defect is introduced at a, an early stage of a project, at the design, for example, uh, the cost to fix it increases exponentially. So the later you detect an issue uh, that appeared very early, then the, the more expensive the cost to fix it. And this can grow dramatically. So if, uh, if you guys have in mind this, uh, uh, these events, the, these blackouts that uh, that happened a few years ago. So there were multiple ones. One in, in the U.S. was uh, particularly uh, shocking. Uh, and having uh, tens of millions of people without energy for many days. Uh, and in the end, uh, the cost of this, uh, of this thing was, a, I mean, it was billions of dollars. Uh, and when we have a look at the origin of it, it was just a software bug in a control room. So like a small, let's say something small at the origin began uh, absolutely huge just because it happened uh, really, really late, let's say in the in the lifetime of the of the system. So uh, if we try to have a, a look at the, uh, let's say, a project view with the main uh, steps that we can have. So this is just a really rough representation with the design, implementation, validation, commissioning, maintenance. Uh, typically, or the old fashioned way to see things, the traditional way is to start detecting issues, detecting problems during the validation stage. So at the, somehow almost at the end of the project. So this is where we start facing problems. Uh, that's not uh, ideal because as we mentioned before, the, the later the detection, the more expensive the correction. So, but this is this is what happens uh, in many cases today. Uh, you are ready to deliver, and then you start uh, encountering issues. So, another way of dealing with this uh, is okay. What about creating prototypes? So, we would like to create prototypes in the lab and to test them extensively. And once we are pretty confident, then we can go for a delivery or an on-site installation. Well. Can be very hard to perform full-scale tests so we might not have the hardware for that uh, or the equipment for that and if we think about downscale prototypes well sometimes it works but sometimes uh, they are not as representative as a full-scale uh, prototype would be so sometimes it can be an option uh, but sometimes it just makes no sense to have a prototype uh, especially when it comes to uh, big systems such as a grid or a micro grid uh, well Having a downscale micro grid, that's fine. Uh, but if we want to have something full scale, well, it's just as if we were building the real micro grid. Second thing is it can be very time consuming to create a prototype. Uh, it takes a long time to build, uh, then to test, then probably to rebuild uh, once we have broken it five times. So that as well is something we have to keep in mind. It can be unsafe, uh, especially if we want to test some. Uh, extreme cases so you take an, any system it has its nominal behavior so if everything goes fine but if something goes wrong well that can it's a different story because either we are dealing with a lot of power or either uh, we are uh, uh, trying to perform some extreme tests which might break the prototype and this is super expensive so some tests are kind of hard to perform with uh, the full scale system uh, because of the cost and because of the danger they represent. And the cost as well is something I mentioned in the end, but it's uh, it can rule how a project goes. Uh, we need to take care about how much uh, we are uh, spending to implement the project. So about the difficulty to uh, perform tests on the field or perform tests on full-scale prototypes, if we take the example of, let's say, yeah, in the in the power system world or in the microgrid world, uh, well, imagine we have one, we implement it, and this is like the, let's say, this is the, the prototype microgrid. Well, uh, what happens if I want to wait for some faulty condition to happen and see if uh, if my microgrid is stable enough? How long shall I wait 
uh, for that fault to appear. And if it appears, will I catch it? And will I be able to check that the strategy worked properly? And how many times can we can I do that? So that's really hard to do in real life. Second thing, time consuming in terms of validation. So we are talking a lot here about how a grid is controlled. So it's it's a software thing. So we have controllers, they have their inner intelligence based on the algorithms, uh, and the amount of code you have inside, the amount of code can be super huge. Uh, we are talking about millions or tens, even hundreds of millions of lines of code. Uh, today, if you take a high-end car, just the one car, you can have a hundred million lines of code. So if you want to test all possible combinations or all possible conditions, well, I mean, it can take a lifetime to do that. So imagine if you have hundreds of distributed controllers and you want to test all these uh, inter interactions between them. Uh, it's uh, it's really hard to do and it's really time consuming. It can be unsafe. So I think the pictures here are enough to understand what we're talking about. If we are uh, trying to trigger faulty conditions or extreme cases uh, to prevent them from happening uh, during real operation, well, we can just break things uh, or we can hurt people. And that's something we never want to see. So in the end, if we try to sum up things, the, the challenges that we are facing here, so we can have hard, I mean, tests which are hard to conduct on the field. Uh, they require huge validation effort because of their complexity or the complexity of the systems. We can have unsafe tests uh, to perform. Uh, again, we don't want this to happen, but if it happens, we want to see what, what would be the consequence of it in the lab if possible. Uh, we need to perform this project faster and faster, and we need to optimize the cost. So that's, let's say, the uh, uh, the everyday paradigm for any project engineer. So uh, the purpose in the end is to be able to uh, validate uh, all this microgrid ecosystem, including the controls and protections, in a complete way. So it has to be, uh, the test coverage has to be as, as big as possible, so fully. It has to be efficient, it has to be fast, it has to be, I mean, not, not too expensive if possible, so we need to control the costs and it has to be performed safely, of course. Now, uh, how can we try to tackle uh, these issues and how uh, real-time simulation can give us tools or approaches to uh, be able to implement in a smoother way such complex systems? Well. It is a matter here of having a, a model, a software model that would be representing uh, some bulky system or some complex system that we want to implement. What we want to do here is to test uh, control strategies uh, that are acting inside a microgrid. The issue if we are trying this with real prototypes or really on the field is that it could take ages to detect a fault. So it could take ages to trigger the necessary conditions to reach some unwanted case, uh, and this might just never happen in real life. So we want to do these tests in a market grid, but without the market grid. So in, the, in that fashion, we are going to replace uh, the market grid by a software representation, a software model that would be able to behave uh, as a real system or very close to a real system. So we are simulating here the market grid. And the nice thing here is that we can uh, perform thousands of runs in the lab. So we can run all the possible cases we want uh, and we will get the results and we will see if uh, it's being controlled properly, if the protections are acting at the right time. Uh, we can test extreme cases, we can test very crazy cases without, uh, uh, let's say, creating any risk, neither for the people or for the, uh, for the hardware. So in the end, uh, thanks to this modeling approach, we want to facilitate the development of these control systems. Uh, we want to, less, to use less physical prototypes, so more virtual, and maybe the physical part would come later on in the project. We can test more complex cases or unsafe cases uh, without taking any risk. Uh, and in the end as well, we can replace some missing parts that would not be available in our setup. We can just replace them by a software representation. So in the end, it's okay, we have a power system or we have whatever microgrid or electrical system and we are replacing this physical system by uh, a real-time simulation, 
that is flexible, that is reconfigurable, and uh, in which we can trigger any possible condition uh, that might happen either in a nominal uh, case or in a faulty case. So, if you remember this presentation we had of, uh, let's say, the discovery of uh, of issues or mistakes in a, let's say, in a control system or a protection system that is being developed. So, uh, traditionally, as we mentioned, uh, the, we start finding issues usually pretty late in the project. So, when the test engineers come and start uh, testing the system, and they say, okay, this is, this doesn't work or this doesn't comply, etc. So you have to rework this thing. Uh, what we want to do with this real-time approach and with these tools that we want to use is uh, as much as possible to detect issues very, very early in the project. And if possible, at the design stage. So before anything has been built, before we have any kind of physical prototype or before we, we even have the real code that is going to be implemented in a in a in a microcontroller we can already uh, thanks to simulation tell if the approach is fine or if the strategy is okay or if the parameters uh, are uh, adapted to the situation so without having any piece of physical hardware we can already say if this thing is going to work uh, we are uh, decreasing a lot the rate of discovery at late stages of the project. So not only is it comfortable for the test engineers or for the complete first that will not need to to rush at the very last minute to correct things before we uh, deliver, uh, but as well the cost of it, it, it will be significantly reduced because things have been discovered very early. So um, two examples of things we can do with real-time simulators. So here you can see one of uh, the units that we, we do manufacture, the OP4510, uh, which can be used, for example, uh, in a model in the loop approach. This is something we can do at the very early stage where we would represent uh, a, the complete system uh, virtually. So we would have, say, the MAC grid with uh, the control systems of uh, uh, every uh, component of the MAC grid, uh, as well as the control system of the complete MAC grid to ensure the power, uh, the, the proper power flows. We might have as well protection systems implemented uh, as well as virtual devices. And thanks to this, we can have a good look. Uh, we can have a, a good idea about how the whole thing is going to work. Uh, later on, uh, we can use the HIL approach or CHIL approach, harder in the loop or controller harder in the loop to uh, test real IEDs that would be uh, implemented in the microgrid. So we would keep, for example, here the microgrid models as virtual uh, elements, but uh, we would connect real controllers or real uh, protection devices or generally speaking, real IEDs uh, to check that they are uh, being, uh, I mean, that they are behaving properly and that they have been configured according to the need of uh, this example of microgrid. Uh, so this is an extra stage to go uh, closer to reality. Uh, and this allows to test real equipment that can go on the field, but all this thing is, the, is done in the lab. So as a conclusion, uh, well, there is a boom, of course, in the development of microgrids, and generally speaking, uh, in um, uh, all this development of a more, in a smarter grid, a more connected grid, uh, because we have smarter things and more control and more software, the development is more and more challenging, uh, technically for sure, but as well economically and regulatory because they remain kind of uh, uh, young systems, so they have not been there for hundreds of years. So it's kind of new and we need to find business, mo business models for them. Uh, the, good, uh, the good thing is that we do have tools that can facilitate uh, the design and the development and the optimization of such uh, complex systems, such as microgrids. So there are tools that can uh, make things happen uh, in an easier way. And for sure, we hope that uh, we will see in the next few years uh, a faster development of these microgrids to ensure uh, a greener uh, implementation and operation of our power systems. Uh, this is it for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention on this section.
Uh, this was the theory, and I would like to uh, hand the microphone and screen to my colleague Ismail, who will be showing you an example of uh, of a virtual microgrid that we can have in our systems, and you will see what kind of things we can do with it. So thank you very much, and uh, Ismail, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much, Yahya. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, do you see my screen? Okay. Yes, we have it. So, yes, uh, yes. Thank you so much. So, yes, thank you, thank you, all of you, uh, to assist with us um, today to this webinar. I am going to present you a live microgrid demonstration. Uh, it is a live um, a demo, so I have. Um, the Opal simulator just close to me, and now I am uh, doing a real-time simulation uh, uh, demo. So just uh, before showing you the live uh, demo, I, I will just uh, give you a, a small introduction. So as you know, uh, distributed energy resources are becoming more and more active, uh, and uh, for sure we want to ensure a proper control on power flows, uh, on-grid and off-grid operation, deliver the key OS. So all these are the challenges that um, um, oblige us to use uh, and to do a real-time simulation. So today I will show you um, a microgrid uh, demonstration. So this is what it looks uh, like. So I will have here a main grid utility that is uh, simulated in our uh, Opportunity simulator. Uh, so it's around six nodes distribution network, uh, and uh, it is connected to uh, a wind turbine. I have a wind turbine of maximum 10 kilowatt, so it deliver uh, the power to my to my network. Uh, I have as well a battery that uh, consume the difference between. Uh, the power generation of my uh, main grid utility and uh, the need of power of, of our, uh, our our loads. Um, and here I have a two-level inverter that is connected to, uh, to the grid in order to transform from a DC to AC or vice versa in order here uh, to inject uh, the power or to consume the power uh, from, from the grid. And I will have as well here a PV solar that um, injects and uh, give us uh, give us some power to to my to my grid. And as well, I have here some some loads, different types of loads. It could be a critical load, like a hospital, uh, a suitable loads like houses and demand response, and critical loads like companies. And then we can here modify after. We're going to see this in the live demo. We're going to uh, change uh, the power demand of our critical loads, and we can as well do some islanding of, of, of this uh, just to keep uh, my one turbine to give me the energy to my, to my critical to my loads. So uh, the benefits of, of Opal solution, uh, as you know, is um, uh, to study the behavior uh, of complex microgrids with high accuracy. Um, you can as well apply many scenarios and simulate very big networks with small time steps. Uh, but the problem is, how can we optimize decoupling? Because uh, as you know, in power distribution systems, uh, we have just very short lines. So we don't have uh, intrinsic to decouple the model for uh, multi-process simulation, so we need the solution on how to de decouple and how to, to optimize decoupling. So the solution uh, for power distribution system decoupling is our solver that is called SSN. So uh, by this, um, thanks to this solver, we can have a transparency towards system behavior uh, and flexibility in terms of processor assignation. Uh, as well, you can have a possibility to add three to four three-phase breakers per group without affecting the real-time simulation. Uh, because as you know, uh, in the Simulink uh, solver, you have um, a state space approach, 
and then you have to calculate at every time the change of the topology you have to calculate all the matrices but thanks to ssn uh, you decouple your model and then you will uh, just calculate small matrices and then and this will optimize your model and let you decouple in your model uh, another benefits of of OPOLRT solution is to uh, study the power electronics in a microgrid so study the impact of power electronics of a microgrid in order to facilitate the in integration and you can have as well a, a grid forming study that uh, allows you to study the, the power electronics to have some converters uh, to have some two level inverters in your microgrid uh, your microgrid um, your microgrid and then it let you uh, do some accurate studies and simulate uh, power electronics in uh, high high frequency switching uh, the, the the other question is but how can we simulate power electronics in the FPGA? So in order to have a very small time step and in order to have very accurate, uh, very accurate results. So uh, accuracy of power electronics um, circuit simulation, as you know, you have traditional power electronics simulation tools and uh, always results are accurate uh, when the time step is very small. So uh, here the, the challenge is to achieve a very, very small time step around uh, microsecond or some nanos, uh, like hundreds of nanoseconds. So our solution is to use a solver that is called EHS. So you will have a power electronic circuit uh, simulated with time steps below one microseconds. And um, this allow very high switching frequencies. So you can have 10 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz for semiconductor technology. So now let's move to the uh, uh, demo type. So uh, here, this is my, 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 my demonstration. So as you can see here, as I as I told you before, this is my main grid utility. So this is my my microgrid. But just before that, uh, let me just show you that this is a model that is in MATLAB Simulink. So this is the MATLAB Simulink model. So here I have all my model. Um, this is my uh, microgrid. So here, uh, as you can see, this is my model, uh, and I can here he have my my PV and etc. So it's a Simulink model. And then I, I am running now my model in our RTLab software. So uh, this is a real-time simulation software. And then here, this is just uh, to use this console. It's a LabVIEW console that you can see here. So as I told you, uh, this is a main grid utility. So it's around the 600 nodes uh, distribution network. Uh, and it's running in one CPU core uh, with a time step it's a very uh, small time step it's uh, a time step of 50 microseconds and i am just consuming uh, 60 percent of the capability of of my cpu core so this is my main grid utility so it gives the power uh, here to my loads and uh, as i told you before i have some wind turbine uh, one one wind turbine of a capacity of 10 kilowatt and the battery and a, a pv a pv solar and here i have my my loads so here i can modify the power so here i can give it a 20 kilowatt to uh, here to my, my microgrid so here i can uh, modify this uh, I, I can as well uh, modify the one wind turbine uh, power that will be delivered to uh, my network uh, here uh, i have uh, the the state of the battery we're gonna see all this in the acquisition part uh, I have here uh, a PV solar, so I can here modify and control uh, the irradiation. It's in watt uh, per meter square, so I can modify it here. And as well, I can modify the demand of the loads here, as, a, as you can see here. And I will see the interaction of all, all, my, all my grid. So if I go to the acquisition part, acquisition part here, I, I can see... Uh, 
not another thing sorry for not uh, telling that but i can also do a, um, an eye landing it means that i want just to cut uh, the 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 gray the, the grid from here and i will let all my uh, like turbine and pv solar to give the power to my critical load so i can do an eye landing uh, process so here if i just return back to the acquisition so I have here uh, a battery, the, the battery. So this is the, the alternative uh, voltage and the alternative current. Uh, this is the direct uh, voltage and the direct current. And this is the state uh, of my battery. It means that here it is charged 50% uh, uh, of uh, its capacity uh, and then here i have the power uh, of my pv solar and uh, the power delivered by my battery etc uh, so here i can as well uh, change the operation mode of my battery so it could be a pq uh, mode or it could be a pv mode um, and etc i can have as well a pv acquisition uh it means that uh, here i have my alternative uh voltage my alternative current here and here i have my um, direct voltage uh, my direct current and uh, here i can modify uh the irradiance and then here uh, as you can see uh, the power is increased uh, what i can do as well is i can uh, do uh, a 24 hours load profile or 24 hours wind profile uh, in order uh, to have uh, the increasing of uh, uh, of of uh, of the irradiance uh, during the day i can as well here if I put this, so it will be automatically. So in the morning, there is uh, nothing. There is no irradiance. And if we wait uh, just some seconds, so it is a, a, a 24 hours profile of irradiance. So here in the beginning, it's, it's zero and it will start increasing. We can wait just some seconds and normally the irradiance uh, will increase. So this is now, it start increasing. So this is a 24 hours irradiance profile. Uh, so here uh, the irradiance, it is increasing. So this is a, a midday. So as you can see here, I have the irradiance uh, increasing, so it it means automatically that the power delivered to my network is increasing. Uh, and then, yes, if I continue, I can see all the profile. So I can see as well here the wind turbine. So here I have my uh, alternative and alternative uh, um, the voltage and and uh, and current. And here I have my direct uh, power. I have my power uh, here. So here I can define here uh, the wind uh, in meter per second. So here I can see uh, that uh, the, the the wind is increasing. And I can as well uh, just um, here put a, a 24 hours wind profile so it will start from zero and then it will increase etc uh, here i can have my profiles so here uh, i can just activate the profile and then we will see the sand intensity the load profile and then wind speed so you can control your uh, your 24 hours profile so as you want depends on uh, your needs so you can like uh, do a maximum of reagents at this hour and etc and then you will see here uh, all the results uh, something that you can do the, the last one is you can here apply some faults uh, to your grid so uh, here i have no fault uh, and then here i can have uh, a phase a to ground fault I can have an A, B, uh, like two, two phases to ground fault and three phases to ground fault. Uh, so let's first uh, just apply uh, a, a one phase to ground, so phase A to ground. So here uh, you can see that I have a fault 
and I apply this fault at this time and of a duration of one second. If, for example, I want three seconds, then you will see that it will be, uh, it will, I will have a fault longer than that. Um, and I can modify the duration. I can as well here put a, a tree face to ground, as you can see here. So I, here I have three seconds of, of fault, and I have uh, my uh, my tree tree face uh, to ground. And I can as well here uh, have the duration of var and etc. So I can uh, control uh, all, all these things. Uh, yeah, just uh, thanks to this interface. So it's um, uh, all for me. So thank you so much for uh, following this webinar. And uh, yeah, feel free uh, to ask all your questions. Uh, all your questions are, are welcome. Thank you very much, Ismail, for this insightful demo. So as you can see, uh, there are many things we can uh, we can we can see in uh, in demonstration with different levels of of detail. Uh, but in the end, it's up to uh, it's up to the user to define what is the uh, the level of representation that is required to assess whatever system. Uh, and yeah, as we say, sky is the limit. Uh, so now we have a few minutes to uh, answer some questions that have been asked on the question box. Uh, so I'll try to answer as many as I can. Uh, for those who uh, do not get the answer right now, uh, we will reach you by email uh, and give you elements uh, and give you answers uh, about them. So um, <clears throat> I have a, a question from Fauzi, who is asking me, uh, is asking if the Opal system is equivalent to the DSpace card. Well, actually, it's the same concept. So we are simulating something and interacting with the real world with cards, uh, with uh, well, I mean, with physical systems. Uh, but in the end, the Opal RT uh, systems are more powerful in the sense that they are specialized uh, or they're particularly good at simulating electrical systems, which is not the case of the DSpace. I mean, DSpace does very nice stuff. Uh, they are super cool, super good at automotive applications, uh, but uh, we are doing, I mean, we are focusing a lot on electrical systems uh, at which we are far better. Um, all right, we have uh, another question here. So uh, it's a question from, from James, James, James Reilly or Riley, uh, sorry for, uh, if I don't say it right, uh, who's asking uh, what data do you need to conduct model in the loop? Is there a list of template or the data points from the model? Well, actually here we're talking about model-based design, meaning that the systems we're talking about uh, are, uh, we're going to represent them uh, using, uh, let's say library-based components. So typically uh, we will have uh, components such as sources, uh, loads, lines, electrical, uh, I mean, whatever electrical component, and we just put them together to create the, the electrical system that we want to study. So it's it's really a graphical representation in most of the cases where you're just putting together the electrical systems as if you were drawing an electrical schematic. Uh, we do have uh, other modules which are not related to microgrids but more to transmission or distribution grids uh, in phaser mode, where we can represent uh, the grid uh, in I mean with tables. Uh, which are going to define the different nodes and the different elements and their characteristics to somehow, uh, yeah, depict what the uh, the grid looks like. Um, right. So we have a question as well from Simon. Uh, what is the type of model of the power converters switching average? And second question. Is the microgrid simulated on the CPU or on the FPGA, and what is the time step? So, uh, actually, on such kind of systems, we can have both. So, we can have average models uh, for the converters, which are uh, far enough if we want to study higher level uh, phenomena. So, if we want to study power flows, so just how the energy flows, we don't need uh, the details on the switching. Uh, if we want to focus on one specific converter and uh, its behavior in case of, of faults, well, then we will need a uh, more detailed representation uh, of the system. 
So in this demo we have seen, uh, it's more average, uh, it's average converters. Uh, they are running on one CPU core uh, and uh, with a time step of 50 microseconds, which still allows to uh, explore harmonic content of the signals. So we can uh, trigger faults and see the dynamic behavior on the currents and voltages upon the faults, uh, but not as uh, accurate as the switching which then requires a, uh, I mean, an FPGA-based implementation. Um, we have a question from Wendy. Uh, Wendy, you're asking, uh, I don't understand exactly which parts are substituted by the Opal system. Well, actually, it's whatever part you want. Uh, depending on what you want to study, you can use the Opal system as a, let's say, as a replacement for a control system. So we can use the Opal as a controller or as a protection, so like a smart device. But we can use it as well as uh, the system that is going to simulate the environment, like the power system, for example. So both cases are possible. And depending on what we want to focus on on the study, we would use the Opal as a controller. So like we put a Simulink model inside and it will act as a controller. Or we can uh, simulate a microgrid inside and then connect a real physical controller to it that we want to test. That's possible as well. Or any combination of them. So we can have hybrid cases where we are going to combine both electrical models and control models as a simulation and connect them to physical devices, which could be as well electromechanical systems and uh, control systems. So the the way you are going to, uh, let's say, simulate part of the system, have part of it as a real device, it's up to you and it depends on what you want to see, what you want to study in the end. Um, we have a question from Juan Sebastian. Uh, he's asking us uh, to make the interface of the microgrid example, do you use other software different to RT Lab? Uh, okay. So the main, uh, okay, the main design environment we are showing in this demo is based on Simulink, uh, which is not the only possible case. We do have a specialized uh, environment that is called HyperSim, which is dedicated to electrical systems. Simulink is more versatile. You can do many different things with it, including electrical system studies. Uh, so the modeling is based on Simulink. Uh, then. RT Lab is the Opal software just to manage the simulation. So it's somehow converting the Simulink into a real-time executable. And then it's just scheduling uh, the, uh, the execution and giving access to uh, measurements and recordings, et cetera. For this demo, we also uh, used LabVIEW just as a graphical interface. So it's, uh, that's what you were seeing with uh, the, uh, the picture of the microgrid. So that was just somehow pasted on top of RT Lab just to present a nice interface. But what is really running, what is solving equations, remains the simulink. So these would be the main tools that we would be using in this case. Uh, I think we have maybe room for one or two questions. Um, OK, we have a question from Victor. Uh, Victor is asking uh, how many cores are used in the demo? And the second question, for integrated microgrid with the power system network, why not use a co-simulation with e or SIM, e -mega SIM instead? Wouldn't SSN for such a large system require a lot from the core usage? Okay, I think we have a user here, an advanced user probably. <laughs> so, well, in this demo, we're using one core. And uh, regarding your question about the co-simulation between e or SIM and e -mega SIM, uh, well, actually what you have seen here is is eMegaSIM. So it's the package to run models on CPU uh, using specialized solvers, uh, and especially this SSN, which is used for decoupling. So eFaserSIM is the module just to run bigger grids, but in RMS mode. So we don't care about the harmonics, but only, uh, as, you, as you might know, uh, about uh, the voltage and frequency and phase stability. Uh, so in this case, the e phaser is kind of out of scope because we uh, we wanted to focus a lot on the microgrid and uh, on the uh, interaction with a distribution grid on which we would like to trigger faults and see harmonic behavior. So what would be the fast harmonics that could be uh, triggered 
by such faults. But yes, your question makes sense. And of course, we could have uh, seen this demo as a phaser domain distribution system uh, connected with a detailed market grid. That totally makes sense. And thank you for your question. Uh, all right. Uh, and maybe one more, and uh, for those uh, who I did not serve, and those who I did not answer today, we'll send you the answers by email. Uh, did you use EHS in the demo you run, and how many cores are activated in this demo? So no EHS on this one, so this one a 100% CPU case, uh, but we do have the case where, or we do have the demo where one of the, uh, the components, and especially the battery, uh, and the uh, converter for the battery are represented on FPGA to have the details about uh, the switching and uh, to be able to combine, let's say, three levels of representation. So the distribution grid, then we we zoom a little bit more on the micro grid, and then we zoom even more into one specific converter on the micro grid. And this allows to have these multi-domain simulations that sometimes can make sense when we want to have a wider uh, view of a complex system. So uh, again, for those who did not receive an answer, we will for sure send you uh, the answers by email uh, as we are running short of time, sorry for that. Uh, this is the end of the webinar. Thank you very much uh, for attending and uh, that you learned something interesting. Uh, please feel free to keep in touch with us if ever you need some more details, or if ever you want to uh, have uh, further discussions with us, uh, uh, you can have access to uh, the solutions that we offer on our website. We do have as well this resource center where you can find articles and demos uh, and white papers and things like this to uh, get some more or feel a bit more uh, things that we can do at OPA. Uh, if I may ask, please do not forget to fill in the survey that is going to pop up once you close uh, the session. That will help us uh, well understand what we did well and what we would have uh, done better if we had the information before. So let us know what went well and what could be improved. And again, thank you very much for attending and I wish you a nice day. Bye-bye. Goodbye.